Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Today's reading comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 35. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen, listen to him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Um, We are in this series uh, called Shift. We began the new year kind of talking about uh, actually the opposite of shift, uh, the word drift, and how we all have this tendency to drift in life. and, And frequently as we start the new year, we realize how far we've drifted, and, and, and so we make New Year's resolutions to try to shift our lives in a new direction, you know, it, with intentional focus. And so as we all are kind of doing that work of shifting our lives in one direction or another, we wanted to reflect on a book uh, by Phil Maynard called Shift 2.0. And, and Phil describes five shifts that he Uh, recommends churches to make, not just as institutions, but that we can all make in our individual lives to grow in our faith and our spiritual health and become the kind of people God wants us to be. And so each week we're going to discuss one of these shifts. Last week Seth preached on the first in this list, uh, moving from fellowship to hospitality, the, the, the way God calls us to open our lives and to welcome the outsider and to love the stranger. This week, we're going to talk about the second one, from worship as an event to worship as a lifestyle. And before we get to the difference between event and lifestyle, I thought we just have to start with that word worship. And and what does the word worship mean? Like, what what comes to your mind when I say the word worship? I think for most of us, when we think about worship, the first thing that pops in our mind is what happens right here in this sanctuary. Whether it's a a full choir and traditional service with organ, or whether it's Frank and the band, and and we, we think of worship as what happens in this space. And this is worship, but but let me just push on that just a little bit. What about what happens right outside these doors? Like, you know, in, in our classrooms where children are being taught about God, our Sunday school classes, or, or even when people are welcomed and received out in the lobby area, is that worship? Or what if we leave the, the next set of walls and go outside the church? And whether we are working with Habitat or building a wheelchair ramp or, or downtown serving a meal at Fletcher Place or Soupson or, or up in Love, Inc., helping with a clothing closet or, or even going as far away as Guatemala or Haiti, yes, those are acts of service and missions, but are they also worship? Or what if we leave the church entirely out of it for a second? What about going to a concert? I have a friend who is a gigantic U2 fan, and he tells me, and he's a very strong Christian, he says, but Dave, the most powerful moment of worship I've ever had was at a U2 concert. And I I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, there was this this way that all, you know, 20,000 of us were transfixed in that moment, and we lost all sense of individuality. We were just born upward and unified. Is that worship? 
or speaking about a moment of unity? Does it, does it have to be music even? What if it's a big sporting event, right? Like, is, is what happens at a stadium, is that worship? And, and, and maybe it's worship of the wrong thing, perhaps, but, but there's no doubt that joy and that celebration when your team has a great player, especially if it's like a come from behind win, the joy and excitement you feel, that, could that be worship? Or what if it's not crowds at all? What if it's just a person out in nature, struck by the beauty and in, in a moment of awe? Is that worship? Or maybe it's a moment of silent meditation and a seeking of peace. My point is, is that any and all of these things could be worship. I mean, Worship just doesn't happen in this space. Worship happens throughout all of our lives. And in fact, if, if we're gonna do what Phil Maynard suggests and go from event to lifestyle, worship has to take place outside these doors. In fact, I think that's one way for you right this moment to measure your spiritual health is to ask yourself, is your life characterized by the presence or lack of worship? Do you have a sense of awe, peace, celebration, joy? Do we have the sense that our lives are oriented around something bigger than ourselves? That there's more to life than just the mundane, but, but indeed there's something mysterious and beautiful that really transforms the mundane, those everyday ordinaries, and fills them, imbues them with, with grace and beauty. Is worship an ongoing part of your life? The word worship comes from an old Anglican word dating to like the 13th century, worthskipe. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak Old Anglican or not. But, 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 but that's where the word comes from. And, and, and what it literally means is to ascribe value and worth. You can see the word worth. To ascribe value and worth and honor to an object or a person. So when we worship... What we are doing is we are recognizing or elevating an object or a person as someone that is of great value. We, by giving that thing our attention, our love, our devotion, our submission, we are elevating it, we are worshiping it. And so the reality is, is that we as human beings are wired for worship. We worship all the time by giving things our our, our time and our attention and our focus and our submission. The question is, are we worshiping the right things, the things God calls us to worship? That's why when we get to, you know, the Ten Commandments, the very first commandment out of the gate is, you shall have no other gods before me. And then the second is like it. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth or beneath in the waters below. Don't, don't set up any other object as an object of worship. Don't bow down to them. Don't give them your submission because that posture of worship, submission and awe and reverence is meant to be directed to God alone. It's not meant to be directed to sports or entertainment or anywhere else. It's, it's supposed to be directed towards the God who created us, who loves us, who knows us. And when we reflect on who God is, when we reflect on his mystery and his greatness, the only response that is natural to such finite creatures as we are is worship. God, you are worth, you are above everything that I could ever give. The question Phil Maynard asks is how do we take that posture of reverence and awe and make it something that lasts through all of our lives, not just something that takes place during a prescribed hour on Sunday morning? How do we go from worship as an event to a lifestyle? And, and if I kind of characterize, or like if I try to reflect on those attitudes, those postures, those approaches to worship, some contrasts come to mind for me that worship as an event, by definition, is episodic. 
It, it's not something continual. It's something that happens one day a week. And let's be honest, in our current culture, in our church, it probably happens once a month or less than that for a lot of people. It, 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 but, but if worship becomes a lifestyle, it's something continuous. And it happens whether or not you are physically in this space. Worship as an event, the focus is on me. Like, we ask ourselves, if it's just, when I come to church, did I get something out of it? Hey, did, did I grow? Did I like what I heard? The focus is on me. Whereas if worship is a lifestyle, the focus is on God, who God is and responding to God and, 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 and listening for who does God call me to be. And so if, if we shift our focus from me to God, then the next contrast that comes to mind is, is how we evaluate worship. If worship is an event, we tend to evaluate it by the quality of the production of the event. Was the music good? Was the sermon interesting? Did I get something out of it? Versus, if worship is a lifestyle, then we evaluate it by, not by how well it was produced, but instead by, by my own attention. How well was I paying attention to God? How well did I listen for his voice? Was I focused where my focus, was my focus where it needs to be? And the last shift I think of is if we go from worship as event to worship as lifestyle, it changes the way we measure. Because if we're measuring an event, we tend to measure worship as inspiration. How did it make me feel? But if worship is a lifestyle, <clears throat> then we measure worship by transformation. How different is my life as a result? To me, this contrast between inspiration and transformation, it, it, as I was writing this sermon and thinking about that contrast, I thought about Bishop Mike Corner, and I thought about a good friend of his, Doug Anderson, who I've been blessed to have as a mentor and coach through the years. And, and Doug Anderson actually spoke yesterday at Bishop Mike's funeral, um, and he shared at that time a dictum that I'd heard from him years ago, and it was something that he and Bishop Mike came up together when they were roommates in theological studies, and, and, and their kind of wise saying goes like this. They, they, they said, events inspire, but processes transform. Events inspire, but processes transform. The reality is that we all need mountaintop moments to inspire us, to lift us up. But, but, but we don't live on the mountaintop, do we? We live somewhere in the valley. And if there's not processes to carry that mountaintop moment forward, it's short-lived. We all need habits, practices, processes of daily living that allow us to carry those mountaintop moments and actually create transformation in our lives. So I was thinking about that, that quote and I thought, well, if there's ever a mountaintop moment in Scripture, it's the transfiguration. I mean, this is the mountaintop moment. It, I, and I'll be honest, this story of the transfiguration of Jesus has always confused me a little bit as a Christian because I've never known what is it about. I mean, why is this story in there? What, what happens on that mountaintop that's so important? And, and was it was, was the mountaintop moment for Jesus or was it for the disciples? And to me, even having studied scripture all these years, I'm not entirely clear around that. The story goes that Jesus, and, and, and the story of the transfiguration appears in all three of uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the story goes that Jesus took the same characters in all three gospels, Peter, James, and John, up on top of the mountaintop to pray with them. And while he was praying, he was transfigured. His appearance was changed. He became dazzling white. And on top of that appeared with him Elijah and Moses, who were the two pillars of the Jewish faith. Moses, the law, Elijah, the prophets. And so these are, these are the people with whom Jesus is seen conversing. And the disciples, interestingly enough, they were kind of tired and sleepy. They fell asleep while they're on the mountaintop. Same thing they did much later in the Gospels in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. But when this transfiguration happens, it wakes them up. They're paying attention. What is happening here? And the question is, what is Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah about? Well, Luke gives us some clues, beginning with the way he starts the story. After eight days, about eight days after Jesus said this, 
What is Luke talking about? Where does the story happen? What happened directly in front of this after Jesus said this? Well, eight days before was that moment in Scripture when Jesus gathered with his disciples and asked them the important question, who do you say that I am? And the disciples rattled off, well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say this, some say that. And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you are correct. On this rock, I will build my church. And then the next sentence out of his mouth, just when Peter is feeling, you know, proud of himself, the next sentence out of Jesus' mouth, it says, and the Son of Man must be crucified and turned over, and after three days he'll rise from the, rise from the dead. And Peter is so shocked by this that the Messiah is going to be crucified. What are you talking about, Jesus? And he objects, and Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, because this is temptation. This, I'm telling you the truth, what's going to happen. So that's what happened eight days before. And then Jesus goes with the disciples up to the mountaintop, talks with Elijah and Moses. And what are they talking about? Well, Luke says they are talking about his upcoming exodus in the city of Jerusalem. You see, Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to be be turned over. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to suffer and die. And then what is he talking about on the mountaintop? The same thing, the exodus, the sacrifice that he is going to make in the city of Jerusalem. Even though he is 10 chapters away in Luke's gospel, Jesus is already preparing himself. He's setting his face because he knows that's where the journey is going. The disciples don't get any of this. All they see is Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah, and and they are struck by it. And and then so Luke says, as the men were preparing to leave, Peter thinks to himself, I don't want this moment to end. So So he blurts out, you know, with Peter, he doesn't always think before he talks. And so he blurts out, he says, Master, it's good that we're here. So let us build three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's make this moment last as long as it can. And Luke even adds in parentheses, he didn't know what he was talking about. Because then God speaks. And he says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. If you know your Gospels, those are the same words that God spoke when Jesus was baptized. And a dove descended from heaven. The heavens opened up and a voice came and said, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then like that, it's all gone. Jesus goes back to looking normal, no bells and whistles, and the disciples are sitting there wondering, what did this all mean? Here's my take on it, is that Peter doesn't understand it's good that we have these moments when the veil is pulled back and we get to see who God is. We get to see God's grace and God's glory. We get to see the light that just dazzles us and overwhelms. It's good to have these moments. And and God even connects the dots with this voice between this moment when Jesus is transfigured and the moment when he was baptized, which is the last moment where, where the veil was completely pulled back, you know? But the veil doesn't stay back. It falls back into place. And then we have to figure out what we do between those moments. Reverend Grace and Matthew, she has this saying that I've always loved. She says, faith is not what happens when we see God, when, when the world is as it should be and we hear God's voice. Faith is, what we, it, it, faith is what happens between the last time we saw God and the next time we see him. We don't live on the mountaintop. The mountaintop fuels us for the journey in the valley. And for Jesus and the disciples, That journey is always pointed towards the cross. So back to Doug Anderson's statement. Events inspire, but processes transform. What we do here is an event. It's a beautiful event. It's an event that happens every week. And I hope 
that all who come, all of us, that we receive inspiration to follow God more closely. But, and, and for some of you, this may be your New Year's resolution. This may be your shift, that just coming to church is the step you're making. And if so, I'm so glad you are taking that step and growing in your faith. But, but I just want to forewarn you that if this hour is not followed up, with daily practices of prayer and, and, and Christian friendship and accountability, if, it, if it's not followed up with service that gets your hands dirty and checks your ego at the door, if it's not followed up with all those things, the inspiration won't last. The inspiration is, is a catalyst that we have to follow up with practices and daily habits that help us take our faith deeper so that we might grow and become the people God wants us to be. Doug Anderson, when, he, when I first heard this quote, he said the same thing, what happens in church is an event. And he says, and because Christians are really good about coming to the events, but not so good about doing all the other processes, we have churches that are full of people who are over-inspired, but whose lives are under-transformed. And I don't know if that describes you this morning. But if you're here this morning, you're wanting more than inspiration. You're wanting transformation in your life. Then I implore you to take a step beyond just the event of worship and into cultivating a lifestyle of worship. And and it could be anything. It could be, you know, just one change in your lifestyle. And that, that step could be just setting aside in the morning a few minutes to read the Bible and to pray and to kind of orient your thoughts and your words and your actions for that day around God's will. It might be five minutes, that's it. But that starts to feed over into those daily lifestyle moments. It it might be that you know that you're here but you're not really connected to anyone. And so the step you might need to take might be joining a small group. Being in a place where people know your name and you get the chance to talk about your faith in real and authentic ways. It might be the step that God asks you to take a service, that there might be some passion in your heart that you're not acting on, and God's calling you to serve in some way that does some good in the world but checks your ego at the door. If there's one word that I want to offer to you. To me, this is the one word that takes our worship from being an event to being a lifestyle. The one word is Offering which I know is that part of worship that we tend to check out the most. If there's any part of worship where we're gonna take out our phones and check our messages and play Candy Crush, it's probably during the offering time, right? Like like we just check out in that moment because the plates are passing by and, and maybe we put a couple bucks in there. Maybe we just feel a little guilt as it goes by. Maybe we listen to the music that happens in that moment. Offering is one of those places where we are least engaged with God. But when I talk about worship as offering, what I mean is that it's all offering. That when you come to this place, we're all coming to offer ourselves to God. And when we sing those opening songs of worship, whether you have a good voice or a terrible voice, it's okay, because you're offering your praise and your thanksgiving to God with your lips. And we come to our time of prayer, we offer the brokenness of our lives and the burdens we individually carry and the burdens our world carries, and we offer that up to God and ask for God's healing and mercy. And when you listen to my sermon, it's an offering. I try to make my words an offering, but but you make your ears an offering. You try to listen. What is God saying to me today? It's all 100% offering. And if we then make it an offering, then that spills over into our daily living. As it says in Romans 12, one of the message, I used this verse a couple weeks ago, but here's what I want you to do, God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. So when you wake up in the morning, offer that day to God. And when you go to work, whether you work with your hands or your mind or your words, you just say, whatever I do today, let it be for your glory, God. I offer it to you. And when you drive home at night to spend time with your family, you just offer a quick prayer and say, God, I make this an offering. Help, you know, the, the meal we share or the moments we share or whether I'm helping my kids with homework or maybe even if I'm just going home to be by myself, make that an offering to God. And as you interact, with your neighbors, as you serve in the community, whatever it is, make it an offering. 
We offer our best to God. And the reality is whatever we offer is never enough. Because we're not good enough, perfect enough. But the good news is, is that we don't serve a harsh taskmaster who tells us what our offering is. It's never enough. Instead, when we offer our lives, we're met with an offering that God makes for us. One of the most special parts of any worship service is communion, which we here do about once a month. But when we celebrate communion, what are we remembering? The offering of Jesus Christ for us. Remember I said, for Jesus and those who follow him, the journey is always pointed towards the cross, to that moment of offering. And if you open up our hymnals, there's a long prayer in there called the Great Thanksgiving. We don't always do it here. We kind of do a little less formal prayer. But if we did the Great Thanksgiving, there's this moment after the pastors repeat the story of Jesus offering, breaking the bread and sharing the cup. Then the next line in the prayer says, and so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer our lives in union with Christ's offering for us. That's what worship is about. We offer our lives, but in that offering we're met with an offering that is so sufficient and graceful and loving that we could never match it. It overwhelms, it subsumes, it, it, it makes us new. And that's the good news of the Christian faith, that when we offer ourselves, we're met by an offering of grace that is that makes good whatever paltry offering we can put before God. And so it's Martin Luther King weekend. And as Seth said, we remember Martin Luther King not because he was perfect, but because he took his life and the circumstances where he was and he laid it as an offering for the cause of justice and mercy. Early in this service, we remember Bishop Mike Corner. And what do we remember about Bishop Mike? We remember his kindness and his gentleness, but we also remember that he made his life an offering for the church and for the people of the church. And I guarantee you know a saint in your life, someone who has offered their life in kindness and mercy that that has touched you in a personal way. And we are called, every single one of us, to do the same, to join our lives to theirs, to offer the best that we have for the best of what God wants for us. And in that daily offering of our lives, we receive Christ's mercy and his grace. That's what worship is about. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we know we are not perfect. And it is so easy, oh God, for us to let our focus shift away from you and to put it on so many other things in this world or in our lives. But but we pray, oh God, that you call us back as individuals and as a collective church and help us to put our focus solely on you, that you would be at the center of our lives, that you would be at the center of our church And that as we focus on you and make an offering of our lives, we might understand how much you offer us. Thank you, O God, for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who renews us and fills us with your grace. It's in his name we pray.